Good morning. I am so glad to see each and every one of you. And I'm so grateful to those of you who are joining us online. We are glad that you're here with us. Now, this morning, we're going to begin with something you probably haven't heard of before. And um, it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to kind of proof this with pictures. But something kind of bizarre happened a few years ago in Toronto. And uh, here's what happened. See, uh, about 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, a man reported a dead raccoon. Okay, a dead raccoon. So that's no big deal, right? A dead raccoon. And then the city responded, sure, we'll take care of it. So the raccoon was just kind of sitting there in the sidewalk. Well, around noon, some people decided to attach a note to the raccoon. And this kind of kind of blew up in a sense. Check it out. Here's, here's the first picture of the dead raccoon. Somebody came over. And thought, you know what? This poor raccoon, it needs to be commemorated. And so there's a picture of a raccoon memorial and then a card and a flower. Taking the, and then it went on from there. Next picture. Now, this raccoon started a hashtag called Dead Raccoon T.O. Toronto. And so it began to be a phenomenon of sorts, and more notes piled up. Next, next picture. Let's go a little quicker. And see, more flowers picked up, and the people signing off. Next picture. More flowers. Next picture. And even more to where there's a candlelight celebration of the poor raccoon. Now, next picture you'll see is the actual van that was going to take the raccoon away. But once they take, took the raccoon away, take a look. There was a candlelight visual in memoriam to the raccoon. And so they came up with another movement about the raccoon, saying he was our friend. He was our, rac- our neighbor. He was our raccoon. Now, you look at that, you go like, really? Well, you got to remember, it was Toronto, Canada, right? Because if this happened in Georgia, that would have been dinner, right? So, now why am I sharing with you something kind of quirky and messed up like that? I'm going to ask you a question. (laughs) After you die, how will you be remembered? How will you be? Because you're going to come up. How are you going to be remembered? They're going to talk about you. What are you going to be remembered for? What are they going to say about you when your name is mentioned? When something that is associated with you come up? See, there was this guy in the Bible, and you may not know his name, but I would dare say it's one of the saddest things associated with a life ever. He was a king of Judah, and it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 20, here's what it reads. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tomb of the kings. There's a lot in that verse, right? But did you pick up on that sad statement about his life? He passed away to no one's regret. No one's regret. What a horrible way to sum up a life. I mean, how do you live a such a life to where no one even thinks about you in a positive way? In fact, Scripture tells us there, you can pick up on the fact that they were almost glad to see him go because they didn't even bury him in the way that they would bury normal kings. Now, I'm not trying to depress you here this morning with a dead raccoon and this guy who's not remembered, but because I get it, 2020 has been depressing enough. But at some point, we have to think about how we're really living and to what end we're living for. Instead of just existing, instead of just surviving. Because at some point, we've got to just quit going forward for the sake of going and stop and think because 
we are going to have an end of our days. Because I believe that we live in a day and time when more and more lives are sadly marked by one defining characteristic. They aren't finishing well. Our lives, so many people, are not finishing well in life. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when another pastor has fallen to immorality. And I don't know about you, but you see time and time again in the news where someone, a business leader, an author, a media personality, an educator, what have you, or it could be an everyday mom or dad. It could be a husband. It could be a wife. It could be a student who ends up in some kind of public ditch somewhere after an affair, after some cheating, after some terrible decision, after some pornography, after some anger or power issues or financial impropriety or what have, what have you. And man, is it just me or are you sick and tired of hearing that? Is it just, is it just me? Or are you like going, enough is enough? I guess the thing about it is when we read about such things, the truth is, any one of us could be the next headline. Any one of us. Unless we invest in the kind of life that finishes well. And finishing well that I'm talking about isn't just about avoiding some social scandal or some, avoiding some epic moral failure. Finishing well I'm, that I'm talking about is living your life in such a way that you are, that you've invited God in your life and that he works through your life. So it's not just simply making it across the finish line with a reputation intact. I hope that's pretty much of a, is, is a given for each and every one of us. But it's about making it to the finish line where we run the race that we were supposed to run and every step along the way, inviting Jesus to be in the center of it and having him work through our lives for the cause of Christ. That's the biblical vision of finishing well. So, how do we, why is it that so many of us find ourselves, and so many lives find themselves in a ditch? Well, there are two great areas of temptation, and this is something that you have experienced over the course of your life or you've seen it in the lives of others. There are two huge points of temptation, two, two, two huge points of struggle. The first point is this, is when we're doing well, when life is going great. See, that's when we are really severely tested. It seems ironic, but during the good times, when everything's going our way, when we're on top of our game, we sometimes can fall into a sense of entitlement. We have this feeling that we're somehow above the rules, that we are beyond what other people have to deal with, right? Other people have to deal with the moral code. Other people have to keep up with some, some disciplines. But no, 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 not me. That's what we can find ourselves into. And therefore, we end up cutting corners. We end up feeling entitled to indulge in some weaknesses in our lives and chase what I described last week as a shadow life. Which is why we're so shocked when someone who seems to have everything going their way all of a sudden just go boom. But the second point of struggle, the second area of great temptation to where we don't finish well is this, is when things are going really, really, really hard. And that describes a lot of people today, doesn't it? When, there's, when we're going through an incredible level of challenge, when suffering is intense and the challenge is always before us, see, we at that point can feel equally outside the law. And here's why. Because we feel entitled and we feel free at that, such a point because, because we're going through so much problem, so many problems. Because we're going through such a hard time, we feel like we are deserving of some kind of relief or some kind of escape. 
After all, who could blame us with all the stuff that's going on? Or we can slip into, because of so much stuff that's going on, we can simply have the why bother mentality. Why bother? My life is so bad. I feel so far away from God anyway. Why bother? Why bother? And that describes a lot of people today. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you're watching today, and that's where you are. Because you feel like it's been so long. It's been so hard. It's, it's, my life is so messed up. Why even bother? So here's what we're going to do today. Today, as we continue in our, our short series called The Good Fight, it's a series based upon 2 Timothy. It's a book of the New Testament. It's a letter that God inspired the Apostle Paul to write to his protege, Timothy. And from here... We are learning what it means to fight the good fight. In fact, in chapter 4, we see the Apostle Paul talking about his life, the way God has worked in his life. He said, I have finished, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. In other words, he went to the finish line and he finished well. And today, I want to talk about what it takes to finish well. I want to talk about how to finish the way that God designed for us to finish. And what we can find in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there are some components, there are some examples, there are some identities that we need to adopt and embrace in order for us to finish as God intends for us to finish. So if you have your Bible with you, oh, go, ahead and open, go ahead and open your Bible app to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to begin with verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning verse 1, it reads as follows. But let's all stand at this moment as we honor the reading of God's awesome word. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning verse 1, it says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach Others, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all this. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, the privilege and the opportunity to be here, to be before your word so that we might be transformed by it. We ask for exactly that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Please be seated. All right, so let's unpack what we just read. Because in these verses... God reveals to us some understanding of how we need to approach our lives so that we may finish well. And the first thing we notice is that we need to recognize that we are to be a, a soldier. A soldier. Go with me again to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now, there are a couple of things that stand out in these passages. First of all, what God wants us to recognize and what Paul wanted to teach Timothy, his protege, his, you know, his son in the faith is to know that he is a good soldier, that we are to be a good soldier, all right? And as a soldier, there is something understood by being a soldier. The something is clearly a given. What is that? Suffering is a given. Does that make sense? For example, how many soldiers have you heard when they come to the battlefield 
And they find themselves going, whoa, 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 time out. How come they're shooting at me? Quit it. Just stop. Why are you advancing against me? You look so mean. Stop it. Now, if a soldier was to do and respond that way, would you not go, dude, don't you know what's going on? Don't you know who you are? And yet, the reason why I think so many lives wind up ending up in a ditch and staying there, because I get it, none of us are perfect. But the problem is so many people find themselves in a ditch and they stay there. And one of the big reasons is because they don't recognize. God never said that our life is to be without confrontation. But the Bible flat out tells us because we're a soldier, we need to expect suffering as a given. And since it's a given, what we learn from the soldier is that we need to build up endurance. Endurance. Don't get caught up with this. Don't get caught up with trying to be like everybody else because you know what? If you're a soldier, you know what that means? Automatically, you're no longer a civilian. I think a lot of times where we fall, where we give into temptation, where we slip along our way of, of understanding what it means to follow Jesus, is because we expect no confrontations. We don't expect struggle and... We expect that we can live like everybody else and not be any different. See, we Christ followers, once you follow him, we find out it's the greatest privilege there is. It's absolutely incredible. But secondly, with that privilege comes an identity that's different. That's different. Soldiers, they don't operate on the same rules. They're not, they, they don't go by the same statutes. In fact, they operate on the basis of what the commanding officer's orders are, right? Whoever is your commander in chief is, is who directs your life. See, the way we fall apart oftentimes is because along the life way, we wanted to follow the rules like everybody else. And as a result, we slip up. We take our eyes off of who we're supposed to follow. See, the commander in chief is Jesus, not society not social media, not media in general, not even our friends. Because if anyone who guides us and directs us apart from the word of God, apart from what our Lord Jesus Christ would have us to be, is to act like a civilian in terms of this example instead of a soldier. You are a soldier. And therefore, in order for us to finish well, what we hear from God is this, soldier on, soldier on, because that's who you are. That's who you're called to be, but not just being a soldier, but you're also an athlete. Now, some of you are thinking, me, an athlete? Yes, you, you're an athlete. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. A bit of a background. You see, in the time of this writing, in the time, days of Apostle Paul, athletes were governed by two set of rules. One is the actual set of rules pertaining to the game itself. You know, like, for example, this is the starting line, that's the finish line, these are, this is the course, and these are the rules by which you have to engage the race. We get that. For example, in football, you know, there's the sidelines, 
You know, there's the end zone. There's a targeting penalty and all kinds of stuff. You've got to play within the rules in order for you to compete well. Otherwise, you're penalized. Or if you do not follow the rules, you can forfeit the contest. Now, that matters. Why? Because nothing of any substance can be gained by cheating. Right? Would that be a real victory if somebody cheated? That's why a lot of us feel like New England with the deflate gate still hasn't won that, right? How many of you feel that way? <laughs> right. The reality is that, by the way, this reminds me of an example of how to stay within the rules. There's a golfer by the name of James Hahn. In 2015, he engaged in the Masters but didn't make the cut. See, he worked hard to win enough to qualify for the Masters, and he was among the contestants to make it to the final cut to compete in the Masters. But he didn't make it, and he didn't make it by one stroke. One stroke. By the way, 2015, uh, the reason why I thought about it is because, you know, we just had the Masters, which is kind of weird. Thank you, COVID, because it's supposed to have happened in April. But anyway, what happened with James Hahn is that when he was on a on green, as he was addressing the ball, he touched the ball. No one saw it. But he knew it. And he penalized himself one stroke. And it was that one stroke that eliminated him from moving on in the Masters. Now, you may say he didn't win but I believe he did because he won where it matters most. He won in the area of integrity. He won because he remained true to that which is right. You want to know how to finish well? It's about having integrity of knowing and living a life that's right regardless of how of how many others are living wrong. But there's a second set of rules back in Paul's day, and this points to more of this set of rules. And this set of rules applies to the athletes themselves who are competing. You see, in Paul's day, in order for you to participate in the Olympic, uh, Olympic Games, you have had to have trained a minimum of 10 months of rigorous, rigorous athletic discipline. So it's the baseline for you to even think about participating. And that's what primarily what Paul is talking about in this verse. And what this points to, again, if you picked up on, is the importance of, of discipline. Of discipline. Doing that is important. Doing what it takes. Training, making the investment in order for us to compete and to finish the game of life that is before us. The discipline, do the thing to do the things that we need to do to become the people we're called to be. In fact, it's one of the most important principles of what it means to live authentically for Christ. Because the heart of Christian authenticity is to be increasingly to be like Jesus. And to be like Jesus, you don't try, you train. What's the difference? Here's the difference. How many of us, we can, all of us can today, right, we can try to squat 400 pounds. Okay, all of us can try that, right? How many of us can accomplish that? Not a lot of us, right? No. And see, I think this is where a lot of us approach following Jesus and get, find ourselves frustrated and finding ourselves spiritually in a ditch. Because we tried it. And because, quote, unquote, we didn't take in the time that we thought it, take, took, it was supposed to take, you know, how come it's not working? I mean, I, I've, been, I've been like praying for at least three days. <laughs> right? I tried it. See, when you have a trying approach to following Jesus, we can find ourselves frustrated. We can find ourselves disillusioned. But training is a whole different matter. 
If you, for example, going back to the, the thing about squatting 400 pounds, hey, you can train to get there. There are exercises you can do along the way so that there will come a time that you can squat 400 pounds. Therein lies the difference. In fact, training is what Jesus himself told us we need to do as we follow him. For example, Luke chapter 6 verse 40 says, everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. When fully trained. Second Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, uh, we read, train yourself to be godly. See, the key to an authentic life that follows Jesus is to order our lives around activities and disciplines and practices that model Christ's in order to accomplish through training that we can't accomplish through trying. You tracking with me? Here's what I know. Whenever I encounter a life that's veer, that veers off course, every time that kind of stuff happens, you can almost always trace it back to a pulling back from a spiritual discipline or abandoning, abandoning a spiritual discipline. For example, people who veer off course oftentimes have ab- abandoned the discipline of prayer. They, don't, they no longer pray. People still fear. People are still frustrated. People are still in pain. But somehow we don't pray as we should. A lot of times, people drop the discipline of reading the Bible. The majority of Christians, according to survey, do not read the Bible regularly. And isn't it interesting? Come on, it's true for so many of us today. When life gets really hectic, when life gets really busy, isn't it often the first thing that goes out of our life is the time time when we read the Bible, isn't it? And when that happens, when we lose discipline on that, we will find ourselves lacking clarity, lacking conviction, lacking peace. And it's no wonder when we disconnect ourselves from the source that brings clarity, that gives strength, and provides hope. Folks, the same in in the way we do when our finances are going out of control. We find ourselves struggling and not and able to manage what's right. Oftentimes, it can be traced back to when we let go of or lacking in our discipline of tithing. See, we forget that all of life is a gift. Your life is a gift. And we're called to be good stewards of that gift. But when we let go of the discipline of tithing, we let go of the focus and the perspective of that reality, and we feel like it's all about us. And we find ourselves slipping into being overrun and overcome by the things of this world. And we start thinking that things are what it's all about instead of recognizing the one who provides everything we need. See, we lose the discipline. And again, you guys are here, so this is not addressing you today at all. But isn't it true when you look back over your life, when you found yourself in a spiritual down curve, you can associate those times with the lack of discipline of attending church. Isn't that true? You know, it's like, I got tired, got to be a habit. You know, I got things getting in the way. I, I didn't want to get up. I mean, COVID happened, and you know what? It's like, it's so much easier just not to do, mess with it, getting ready and actually show up at church. But when those things happen, you, you notice in the past, when you let that discipline go, your life slides downhill. Guys, Jesus tells us, you are an athlete and you are meant to run your race and you are meant to hit the finish line strong. But in order for you to do that, 
there are certain disciplines that need to be maintained, need to be held on to in order for you to live the life that God intends for you to live, that God created you to live, which includes making a difference for eternity. But there's a third thing that we see in the scripture. Farmer. You're also a farmer. And this example, for some of us, if you're like me, who didn't grow up with any concept of farming, you kind of have to learn, right? But Paul says, according to you know, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes and tells Timothy that if you're going to finish well, you have to be like a farmer too. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says, The hardworking farmer should be first to receive a share of the crops. The idea here is that if you work the land, you should be the first to benefit from that work. Now, to which we would go, duh. It makes sense, right? But in the days of Paul... A lot of farmers didn't own their land. And as a result, they were more like sharecroppers, you know, who, who worked the land for someone else's, who owned the land. And it's not that they don't get any of the crops, but they got to share that harvest with the one who owned the land. And in Paul's day, a lot of times the city owned most of the farmland. And so all those who put in the work the city benefited before the workers did. So what Paul is saying, according to the, the Spirit of God, is saying that it is the, those who worked hard in the land who should benefit first. So the point is, is the importance of work. Importance of work. Now, here's the reality. You can't mail it in and hope to finish well. You can't. You can't coast to the finish line. And I know that in our society, and in those of you who are retired, man, I'm grateful that you are, that you don't have to vocationally be engaged in the way you were. I know for those of us who are working, are just like, I'm living for retirement. You know, isn't that interesting? We're always living for that time when we don't have to, right? Like you as a student right now, aren't you looking for a time that you've graduated to the point where you don't ever have to open the textbook again? <laughs> See, we're always looking for the next stage where we can stop doing something. But here's what we need to recognize spiritually. When it comes to following Jesus, there's not a point where you go, I'm done. Because you never arrive this side of heaven. You never arrive. And because of that, the point is that we need to pursue hard work all the way through. All the way. All the way. The reason why we don't find ourselves where we need to be in life is because we think that we can arrive and we can kick it in neutral. Like we, come on, we get to a certain level and we're like, oh, this is pretty good. And what we do is we fall victim to this myth called neutrality. Now, how many of you, when you reach a certain miles per hour in the speed, and this is the day before cruise control, and let's say you didn't pack cruise control, cruise control on now, you hit 75 and you let your foot off the pedal, what happens to your car? Does it stay there? We know that. And yet, why is it that we fall into the, the error of thinking, once we arrive at a certain level of intimacy with God, or intimacy with anybody else for that matter, we can cruise and think that we're going to be same place. It's because we've forgotten the importance of what the farmer can teach us. There's never a moment where we can work hard. We need to work hard 
to move forward as God intends us to move forward. Now, some of you are thinking, well, how does this happen? Like, I get what you're saying. The goal, and here's what 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 tells us. It's kind of like a summation of what we're talking about, and it also gives us a challenge. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And folks, the reason why I'm talking about finishing well is because the goal is for us to be able to stand before God to present our lives before him without shame. That's the goal. How do we do that? Well, we also find it in our, this verse 15. How? Because interestingly enough, he says the one approved worker who isn't ashamed is also the one who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, we're going to come back to this passage some other day because there's, this, this verse is so rich. But for today, we're just going to hit it briefly. The word that is translated handles is the Greek word orthotomeo. It's a combination of two Greek words. And if you heard the word ortho, how many of you have ever been to an orthodontist? Okay. An orthodontist is the one who fix crooked teeth to make it straight. Ortho means to straight. If you go to an orthopedist, it's because he wants your skeletal system to be straight as it needs to be, for your spine to align. And therefore, the, the literal understanding is that someone who can handle, who can cut the word straight. And the apostle Paul was talking to his protege, Timothy, who was also a minister. And he's saying a minister's responsibility is to cut it straight. It's to tell the truth straight. Lay it out there straight. Do not compromise truth, but just communicate it in its entirety. Right? Now, as a pastor, that's my role. But how it applies to all of us is this. If the word of God, if the truth of God is to be communicated straightly, as it is, then we all need to be able to handle receiving that truth that is straight. You with me? Because we live in a day where we receive some truth because it feels good. Oh, I like it when God says, he's going to bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. Yes, praise God. Amen, amen. And what about the other verses that go, oh, I don't know, it's kind of uncomfortable. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to handle that one. But what we are learning here is that if we're going to handle and what it means to understand what it means to finish well, we need to receive, we need to handle the truth. And not to go off on a movie line, too many of us can't handle the truth. But let me lay some truth down for you. Okay, here's some truth. You're going to die. You are. Talon, you're so chipper. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I showed up today. Hey, listen. <laughs> Look. Too many of us end up in a ditch and stay in the ditch because we don't see the end as we should. We live as if we're never going to die. But the truth is, we are. Unless the Lord comes back to take us home before our physical death, guess what? There will come a time. That's why one funeral director years ago, you know what he said in his business card after his name? His tagline was, eventually yours. That's an inevitability. So the question is this. How are, you going, how are you living your one and only life? Because right now we're living as if we have every single opportunity to make it right. As if we'll have, you know, as, as if we'll have the next day to make a decision for Jesus. The next day to live for the glory of Jesus. We have all the time in the world to make it right, but you don't because you never know. 
because a timer is going to go off on your life like it just did then. <laughs> that was good. So you get where I'm going with this? So, so that's the truth. And at the end of life, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. You may not like the truth, but that's the truth. You will live in either heaven or hell, depending on what you've done with the Lord Jesus Christ personally in your life. You're going to spend eternity somewhere, either heaven or hell. There's no in-between purgatory. No, no, no. That's not biblical. So, the que- so here's the thing. Here's the good news for those of you who have asked the Lord Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You're repented of your sins and trusted in his perfect sinless blood that was shed for your behalf. You trust in his resurrection because as he is alive, he has given you new life. If you've done that, here's the good news. Here's the truth. This is as close to hell as you're ever going to experience. This world is as close to hell as you'll ever feel. That's the good news. If you're not a Christ follower... Here's the reality. This is as close to heaven as you'll ever experience. This is as close to heaven as you'll get. And that's why we want you to choose Jesus. Give your place your faith in Jesus. Because we don't want you to be without him. And the good news is when you go to heaven, guess what? You enjoy a life beyond your imagination, pleasure beyond all all understanding. Why? Because you're the one, you're with the Lord Jesus himself. And there will be finally a life without tears. There will be no more suffering, no more wickedness, no more darkness, none of that. It will be over. Aren't you excited about that? But there's something you will never able to do in heaven. They will never ever do. You will never ever be able to do. You will never ever have the opportunity to endure for the glory of Jesus. You won't. You will never ever have the privilege of enduring for Him. Um, just yesterday, I was talking to Purity. I was watching football, and I said, Pure, I miss competing. I miss competing. I miss running down the field as fast and as hard as I can and ram my body into another dude. I miss it. Some of you think that's lacking intelligence, but, man, I find it incredibly delightful. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? How many of you, as an athlete, miss... Running, because that's what you did. Or playing tennis, because you can strike that ball and feel that ring off the racket and making that place in that shot. Stepping back and just nailing the three-pointer. There are some things, because you've moved on, you can never do again, but in this moment, you can go, oh, I wish I could go back and do that. How many of you have thought that before? Okay, let's talk about something more substantive than sports, right? Okay. I remember when Period and I had the privilege of holding our daughters when they were little babies. We are thrilled for the stage that we get to experience with our daughters where they are. We are. We're just delightful. It's been, it's been an incredible experience as parents, but come on, let's admit it. How many of you remember back when they were little babies. <laughs> and have you ever had these thoughts? Oh, I wish I could go back. Oh, I wish I could go back. If I could go back, I would have loved more. I wouldn't whine about having to walk my baby because of a colic every, at 3 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the morning. I wouldn't look at that moment and think, 
oh, what a pain. Oh, what suffering. I would look back in those moments saying, what a privilege. Why? Because I get to hold my baby. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Come on. Talk back to me. You guys, are you tracking with me? Thank you. And you don't even have never had a baby either. I'm like, yes, I am a baby, but I'm a manning over here. Anyway, but here's the deal. Do you ever look back and go, yeah, those hard times, I don't care. Because I, in a heartbeat, I'll go back and do it again for the privilege of enjoying that opportunity. See, let's go back to the passage that we started in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2, excuse me, verse 1 says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. There are many ways we can see that passage. But one of the powerful ways we can understand that is to recognize that God is telling us Be strong in the grace that God gives you can be understood as be ready to receive or take advantage of the opportunity that is before you. You have been given grace because as a Christ follower, there's no suffering in heaven. So there's no need for this type of endurance. But only in this side of heaven do we have the privilege of saying, you know, Lord, this stinks. This hurts. This is hard. <laughs> but I will choose to be faithful in the midst of it. Because the way I endure suffering for your sake as a good soldier is a privilege I will never have again. And I will praise the goodness of God in this moment I'm in right now. Because right now, you're going through a mess. I get it. Our society's a mess. Maybe your personal life is a mess. But here's the good news. You can live in a way that you can finish well by choosing right here, right now, I will endure for Jesus. Because here's the thing you're going to find. Once you get to heaven, you're going to see Jesus as he fully is. And your mind is going to go, and you're going to go, why did I even waste a nanosecond not living in total adoration of you with every breath of my being? Because I have just witnessed the God of all the universe, and I am so unworthy, and yet here I am spending eternity with you. Whoa! See, that's our future. And I promise, once we get there, we will regret the time that we didn't live faithfully, even in those moments that required endurance. How do you f- endure? Because you recognize that we get to soldier on. It's a privilege. And we can choose by faith to live a life of discipline because what the level of discipline, the kind of discipline that is, isn't needed in heaven, that is needed here. And the work. You know, one thing we can't do in heaven is we'll never have the privilege of working for the eternal salvation of somebody else's life. Heaven, we will engage in things like you wouldn't believe, but guess what? You will never, ever, ever get a chance to do again in heaven. You will never be able to lead somebody else to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's the work that is before us. It is the only work that is preeminent this side of heaven. Because it's the only cause that makes an eternal difference. So guys, let's get to work. Because you know what? I promise you. Our cafe team that showed up this morning 
Have you seen the It's Time to Make the Donuts commercial? The guy comes in, dragging his It's time to make the donuts. Remember that commercial years ago? Some of you don't remember it. Anyway. We're like, i got to serve the Lord. Guys, you will never have the opportunity to serve the Lord in your exhaustion again. You will never have the privilege of offering the sacrifice of praise that comes with pushing past your quitting points. You will never have that privilege again. Because you will never have the privilege of engaging and partnering with the church. You will never have the privilege of ministering and sharing your faith with your neighbor or your friends or co-workers so that they can know Jesus for themselves. Some of you say, but that works so hard. I understand, that's not easy. But isn't that the greatest privilege in the world? That someone else would find, find themselves eternally in heaven because you lived and because you were faithful. See, that's what's before us. How do you finish well? It's to recognize that Jesus is everything. In fact, it is because of Jesus who endured the cross, denied himself, and said on the cross, it is finished that we are able to have salvation. And it's with Jesus, with his, with our focus on him, that we're able to finish and finish strong. It's really not how you start. It's how you finish that matters. And don't you want to finish well? I believe you do. And what that means for some of us right now, the worship team's going to come and lead us to a time of response just now. But here's the deal. Right now, your choice in this moment is that, you know what? I haven't living, been living my life. I've been living on cruise control. And if that's you, today's the day you say, Lord, I recognize I won't have this privilege again. I won't have this moment again. I want to live my life more faithful, more committed. And that's the decisions some of you need to make. But there are some of you here this morning that you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior. And today, the way you finish well is to begin there. To begin there, we say, Jesus, I believe you are my Savior. I believe you died on the cross. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I want to confess you as the Lord and Savior of my life. Come in. I'll give you my life. So today, I will lay my life down because I recognize you've been good. And I will remain, I will live the balance of my life declaring your goodness. Let's all stand as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. And I ask that you move us today recognizing that our lives tell a story that we will be remembered for something even after we're gone. And may our lives declare how good you are not because what we're going through is good, not because the context where our lives are in is good. But you are good. And living with you, living for you, is a life worth pursuing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.